Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, that was a fabulous round of introductions. It was really great to, to hear everybody's interests and uh, what you're all working on, um, or what you would like to work on on your land. Um, if you need a quick stretch, go for it. <sighs> and then we are gonna start talking about PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. And uh, while we're stretching, uh, Heather made the good point. So, uh, Jean, I don't know if your audio is here, but you could, or if your if your audio is through the computer, but you could try dialing in by phone, um, so we can hear you on the phone. Um, and Jean, I will try to type something in the chat box for you with the with the phone number, just to be sure. Um, there should be a phone number along with it, but I'll I'll try to get that to you. Okay, um, I'm gonna. So at this point, we might want to switch to speaker view, and then Tish is going to lead us through PPE from head to toe. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. So I, um, I, I'm not muted, am I? We got gotcha. you. Okay just came up and said I was muted. I'm like, I don't think I am. So um, usually this is kind of a tag team. So I'm going to ask Tim to kind of be there as well um, to kind of help out. Um, but we start with our PPE and we usually start from the head to the toes. Um, if you have any questions, it's easier if you just type them into the chat box. And I'm going to just restress again what Amanda did that saying that this a webinar does not in any way constitute you able to start a chainsaw and we're not going to do that at all um, but what it will hopefully do is give you some good information for you to go out and get the proper um, equipment that you need to be safe so that when we do meet face to face everyone is all set and ready to go which is even more exciting so um, this is really good and we're going to start like I said from the head to the toe So um, what's really important is having some form of ear eye uh, protection and also just a head protection. Um, not maybe if you're maybe doing firewood, firewood you need to have a face protection, eye, eye protection, ear protection, but if you're working in the woods, you also wanna have some sort of a helmet. And we get around that, um, not that we're getting around anything, but we get uh, use, uh, this is called a, a cutting helmet, and I will show you all the pieces to it. It has a face shield, it has earmuffs, and it has the hard helmet. I don't know, this is, um, this is one style that you can have having, you can also use just earmuffs um, with safety glasses if you were just cutting firewood, but if you're out in the woods, it's recommended to have um, some sort of a cutting helmet. And I don't know if Tim um, can show you his cutting helmet because his style is a little bit different than mine. So Tim, if you could just say something real quick so that the speaker view switches over to your screen. I'm mute. There we go. You can hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the most common Sawyer's helmet that you're going to find on the market. This one happens to come from Levonville. Uh, Tish's is more of a climber's helmet, uh, which is improved in a lot of ways over this. But this is the most common one that you'll find at, at any hardware store or any forestry supply right here. Your hearing protection, face shield, six point suspension on the bottom, and a ratcheting adjuster on the back. And I like to also add when I'm working, I use the squishy things in my ears too. Double protection for my ears. So these are the squishy things that, right uh, oh, you have them? Yeah, I've got them right. Okay. Squishy things. If you roll them up with your thumb, squeeze them and stick them in your ear and hold it there while it expands all right i don't know what the decibel reading is on this i'd have to check but if you add the decibel reading or protection on these squishy things to the decibel protection on your hearing protection that's on your helmet or your earmuffs combine those two and you're doing a lot better than just one by themselves Is 
Fish, um, I, I believe you're going to get to this, but we have a question about um, if there's helmets that are sized for women uh, or if there's a way to adapt the traditional ones to uh, for a smaller size. So one of the things that, that um, <clears throat> and uh, Tim alluded to it, but I can show you maybe uh, a little bit different here is that um, it has a dial in the back. This one is what mine looks like. Sometimes it's a button and it, you can adjust it that way. And those are the best to, um, to purchase because it does allow you to have more adjustments. The helmets that just have a strap across the back and then some holes in them is really difficult. It's, it's hard to, and this is where for women it's hard because if you have a ponytail um, like Amanda has, it's it's hard to adjust it. So Amanda, does your your uh, helmet have uh, the the knobby in the back, or does it have the strap? You're muted. Like she's got a knob. Oh, she's a knob. Had, okay. Yeah, I had to take off my earphones. Um, but yeah, you have to. I have to lower my ponytail enough so that the helmet fits, um, even with the adjustable strap. <laughs> But any sort of knob that you can get that adjusts, it will, it will adjust the inside suspension here. Oops, sorry, inside suspension in here. And if you notice, my helmet has only four suspensions. Um, Tim's had six. That's a, another a comfort level. The one thing that my helmet has, is, as Tim mentioned, is a chin strap, which I personally really like. So um, it stays on better, and I can uh, move around and not have everything adjust. Uh, you know, everything stays with me, kind of like the headset, which I can't take off right at the moment. But one thing that is very important that you're not going to get if you, um, in any other class, but here in Women Owning Woodlands, is um, what to do with your hair. And if it is long, a lot of folks will think that they can put their hair in braids, and that's going to be okay, and it's not. You want to have your hair behind you in a single ponytail or in a braid, so that, um, it stays off of you. If you're bending over and you have your saw in your hand and you're bending over, if your hair is long enough, those braids will hit the chain. And I am speaking from experience because I have done it and it was really, really scary. So um, whenever you're trying to helmet on, make sure that you are, your, you know, your hair is pulled back into a ponytail and you can adjust it and you should be able to turn your head and not have it come off. And the other thing that's nice about that adjustable part is that if you are, if you have a, um, you know, if you have a headband on or if you're wearing a, 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 any sort of ties on your hair, it doesn't affect any of the, 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 the helmet um, efficiency. So it's just that, that variable back um, button makes it a lot easier just to have any, any um, flexibility that you might need with your hair. But I can't stress enough putting it behind you uh, in one ponytail, behind you either in a braid or in a ponytail, just to keep it off of your face and keep it away from you. Which brings me to the next um, point with respect to, I mean, well, we also talked about the face shield. Um, if you look at this face shield, it goes down and has a cover protecting it. I don't know if Tim's does. I, I know. Um, and if you look at Tim's, there's no gap. Yeah, he's pointing to it right now that there's no gap between the um, face shield coming down and the bridge of the um, helmet. And that's really, really important because you're trying, you want to make sure that you don't have any debris that gets in there because somehow it always manages to have some sort of debris. Some, you know, things get in, branches get in, it's kind of nuts. So you want to have, make sure that your helmet has that cover and that protection as well. And what's nice about the earmuffs, if you have earmuffs that are attached, you can actually take these out and replace them. So that makes it nice as well. Fish, but, um, about the sizing, are all of those helmets one size? So part of that earlier question was that they have everything ratcheted down as tight as it will go, and it still kind of slides around. So I don't know if there's, um, if you guys have like kind of worn wool hats under or if there's some sort of trick like that to, to fill out that space. Um, um, 
they they might want to just try. I mean, it, there are some helmets that that ratchet down more than others. Mm. So it may be a case that they have to. I mean, I know the Arbor's helmets ratchet down really small, um, and it may be just a case of trying them to see. I mean, you can fill the space, you know, with a bandana. Um, what you don't want is your helmet to be shifting back and forth and all around. You want to make sure it fits securely. So, you know, if you put on a hat and, you know, you can't tilt your head down and, and keep it from falling off, that's not very helpful. Tim, do you have any suggestions? I, I think having, I think looking around, um, so like I said before, this is the most common helmet you, that you're going to find on the market anywhere. Um, but I'm a small person. I've got a small head and I actually had to modify mine in order to get it to ratchet down enough to really fit securely on my head. Um, I think a helmet's like, like Tisha's. It has more points of contact to hold it on your head than this one does. And uh, maybe even researching the companies that actually make helmets. Elvix is a really common helmet maker. Um, maybe you can piece things together that way. But it's not, it's not easy. Um, even for all of this protective equipment, um, going to the neighborhood hardware store might be okay if you are a common sized person. And even then I have noticed that the local hardware suppliers tend to assume that if you're gonna work in the woods and you are a larger man, <laughs> And that is where you're going, that's the size range that's going to fit you. Whereas I certainly am not a larger man and have had a, to modify lots of my equipment to make it work for me too. So it so, is kind of a challenge, you'll have to shop around. Yeah, thanks Tim. I think this is really good information and there's some more suggestions coming in in the chat box. Um, in the interest of time, because we still have to get from head to toe, I think we might need to move on um, and this, the uh, kind of continued discussion about modifying might need to happen during the breaks or, or afterward. Um, but we're getting started with uh, protecting your ears, protecting your eyes, um, protecting your face. Um, and feel free to type uh, questions or suggestions into the chat box. Um, but Tish, I think we might need to move on a little bit. Sorry. Okay. I just, the other thing is if you, um, is to wear at least have ear protection and safety goggles. Uh, safety goggles tend to um, fog up, which is why we go with the face mask. But those are my that last point of that. There are um, there are there are shirts that you can get that have Kevlar in them. When we're in um, John John Cullen has a shirt that has Kevlar in the shoulders. That tends to I mean it's just another safety feature because if the saw kicks back at you. And it usually, you know, if it does, it's going to go this way and there's Kevlar that's in the shoulder. Um, that's a nice safety, safety feature. It's not required, but it's just uh, something, again, to kind of help um, just be protected. Um, and that, what's nice about the shirts is that there's not usually a challenge to find them to fit you. So that's good. Um, things that are a challenge. Things that can be a challenge for women are, um, besides the helmet, are gloves. And you want to make sure, I mean, it's getting better. It's getting better than it was 30 years ago or maybe 35 when I started. But it's getting better um, that they have gloves now that we were talking about Kevlar. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Kevlar. But that's the material that is um, help stop the chain and it basically binds up the chain. So you want to, if you can find gloves that have Kevlar in them, that's helpful. It's, um, so these are, unfortunately they're pink. I don't know why they think that women just want pink, but we won't go in there. Um, but these are gloves that are pretty good. They have some cushioning in here. They fit. One of the things that's very important is to make sure that your gloves fit well and that you don't have any space in the fingers because that can be a safety issue. Wearing gloves that are too big for you will have a problem with um, getting stuck 
and we're going to go over this a little bit closer, but if you have a glove that's too big, it can actually get stuck into the throttle and you can't get it out or it will keep the throttle going when you don't want it to. So you want to make sure that your glove fits well, fits tight. You want to make sure that it has a strap on the front so that it's nice and snug that you don't have the ones that have the cuffs because the cuffs, there's gonna be debris that gets inside of it. Like, um, you know, the chips from the saw. So you wanna make sure that it, all the, you know, that everything has it is tight and snug. Um, I didn't, I don't actually even own the kind that have that, that cuff because they're just kind of a pain. Oh, but- Amanda's um, got some of those and yeah. It's oh, does she? Not, oh, perfect. Not, not pleasant to get that loaded up with sawdust, is it? <laughs> it's not and the thing is the whole you don't want to have to be distracted when you're working with a saw you want to make sure that you haven't had a fight with anybody that you, that everything is a, a, a 10 you're not going to use your you know if you're upset with something you're not going to go outside and start cutting up wood and you don't want to have any distractions so you want to be thinking exa of exactly what's in front of you and you know having stuff coming down you know you're into your hands I, I, I am, I have very sensitive hands and feet. It just drives me absolutely wild. I don't want to be thinking about those chips that are going down my hand or that are causing me to have to think about something else other than that wood that's in front of me. So you want no distractions. So that's what we're trying to do is just mitigate those. And you can mitigate it by making sure you have gloves that fit. If, they ha if you have Kevlar, that's really good. If they can have some padding in it, that's really good. But the biggest thing is just make sure that they fit. So, so questions with about gloves. So we've got one here asking about just using leather or, or fire gloves um, as opposed to the Kevlar. You can, I mean, these are just leather. These do not have Kevlar on them, in them, um, but they, have, they do have some padding. The, um, so when you said, did you say fire gloves? Like, so yeah. fire, line, fire line gloves. Um, so working as a firefighter. Um, so, so Emily, I think um, you want, ideally you'll have gloves that fit. I know that you don't always get good gear issued, um, but having gloves that fit you well and aren't too bulky and aren't going to slide around on your hands would be ideal. You can also, I mean, and I know you're in South Carolina, you can, you don't have to have to wear gloves. Um, but again, for Tish's uh, reasons of not being distracted um, by all the stuff that can get on your hands, um, it, it can be beneficial to wear gloves and protecting, you know, it's PPE. You know, personal protective equipment, uh, protecting your hands from other things that you might encounter if you're, you know, clearing brush at the same time. Yeah, it really, I mean, it, um, the last thing you want to do is just have a distraction. And at least here in Maine, we've got, our trees have a lot of pitch to them. I'm down south, you've got trees that have a lot of pitch on them. You don't want to get that on your hands and then putting your hands on the saw because it's just, it's, everything gets dirty and you just you don't want to do that either so um and if you're grabbing things it makes it tough if i mean mm -hmm. if barehanded makes it really hard to just you know grab a branch and pull it out of the way there could be vines on it there could be thorns on it by having a hand your hands protected it just makes it easier just we got another question about sourcing um like where where would people go to find some of these gloves and shirts that are sized for women um you know interestingly enough not the shirts as much i mean shirts that you can get online now without a problem um but a lot of the garden stores i mean i um these i actually got through duluth trading i just wanted to try them and they're pretty good um but a lot of the garden stores now have the gloves that are, you know, um, fit women, and they're even the e, um, anything that has an elastic cuff is going to be fine. It's just going to be protection. They've got gardening gloves that you can actually like pick up dimes. I mean, they're really they're they're good, um, but they have that rubber rubberized um, palm, which helps. So you can go to garden stores, and, and what you can do is try them on at garden stores, and then order something online if you wanted to. If you you know find uh, a reputable chainsaw place. Uh, most places now do have some women's stuff, which is getting, it's much, much better, um, or they can order it for you. So if you have a local chainsaw shop, you can get them there too. And then just lastly, we had a really good point about, you know, uh, briars and poison ivy and all that as far as protection for the, the reason for having gloves on. 
if you cut into a poison ivy plant, you spray that oil all over the place. You want to be as covered as possible. So. Yeah. Yep. Good point. So um, we're going through this wicked quick. I do apologize. Um, Tim just put something up about Le Bonville. I have not had any success in Le Bonville because of the size issue. Um, they just, they, you know, you got to be 5'10 and, you know, 180 pounds or larger. So, um, but maybe Tim's had better luck than I have. Um, but Bailey's is good for sure. Um, I'm going to move on because we had only half an hour and normally this is like an hour and a half, <laughs> two hour discussion. So we're going to keep whipping through this. Tim, am I forgetting anything from head to shoulders to hands? Are we good? You're covering everything, Tish. Okay. <laughs> In the Reader's Digest version. So we're going to go on to um, chaps. And um, I, if nothing else, if you can get a helmet and chaps and boots, that's like the primary um, best, you know, the minimum things that you really need to have. And chaps are probably the most difficult thing for women to um, get, although that too is getting better. Um, it's second to the boot issue, which will be our last topic. But there's a couple of different styles of chaps. And um, I'm going to try to show you. So this is what they call the apron style. If you notice, it has just one straight leg. Can everybody see that? OK. And it has a hook on the bottom. And then this is a, up at your thigh. And this is the front of it. So this apron style is the most common uh, that are sold. They do OK. But what's interesting is, and this comes from a reputed dealer, Forrester Supply, there's two things you want to look at with your chaps. One is to make sure that it has a UL label, which these do not. And two is that you really want the wraparound style. Here's what the UL label should look like on a pair of chaps. Can everybody see that? So you should have a UL label. And what is, is that? that? mean <laughs> that is what is it united who knows it's essentially like a certifier Underwriter, underwriter's means. laboratory underwriter's mm -hmm. laboratory thank you for whoever presented but it means that it's met a benchmark it says that it has met a certain safety standard and that's what you want to make sure that you have and um, they're starting to have that in helmets now as well but you want to make sure it has a ul label and you also Again, for safety, these chaps, hey, these chaps are mine. They're well loved. But if you notice the bottom of them, they're wrap around. Does that, can everybody see that? So that these end up wrapping around your leg, which is really good because next week we'll see a video of why the wraparound is so important. But it actually, so this is looking at the bottom of it, but it wraps all the way around. And this is looking at it from the top. I'm in a very small space, but it wraps all the way around. And this is really a lot better in the sense of protection. These are nice <clears throat> because they also have a buckle that you buckle and it can adjust very easily. In the winter time, I have 16 layers on. So it's a nice, easy buckle, it just clips off, but it just very easily. And the other thing that you really want to make sure with your chaps is that they go to the to your boot. And if you look at these chaps, that don't have the UL label, and you look at the ones that do have the UL label, I don't know if you can see, I don't have enough room, but there's about a six inch difference between this chap and this, these chaps. So these chaps are longer and they're better. So when you are looking for chaps, make sure that they get to the top of your boot. 
you want them to come down to at least this part of your boot, if that makes sense. You don't want them to be too long either, because then they're a drag. Then they're a tripping hazard, right, exactly. So there's a there's a, a balance between it, but you definitely do not want them to come to your the middle of your calf, which is for me, that's what these would do. They're 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 just too short, and they don't. This apron style does not protect the back part of your leg at all. And there's different. So there's just a, a real quick review. Make sure it has a UL label and make sure that it's, um, it comes down and, and protects your leg and there is a wraparound style rather, rather than the apron style. Okay, so we got a question that uh, um, someone here was working for, um, I think it's the US Forest Service and they were given uh, apron style versus wraparound and are aprons cheaper or like what, why do you think that the government's going with that issue? So I can, um, I think, you know, uh, some of it could be cost. Some of it too is just education. Um, that that's usually what, <clears throat> usually when you go to a saw shop, um, if they're selling you the starter package, the starter package has the apron style in. Um, I don't know, Amanda, you might be able to address that question more. I don't know. So uh, Emily works or has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I, I think you're right. It's probably a, a funding related issue. Um, they're um, they are they like you said they're okay, but really the best are wraparound style. And it could be an opportunity to just kind of educate and to say, hey, look, you know, um, here's what's recommended is wraparound, and here's the safety reasons why. Because what ends up happening when we talk a little bit more about the chainsaw and the chain. What ends up happening because of the way that the saw is designed, the chain's going around, it can actually, if it hits the chaps, pull the chaps and ends up exposing your calf if, you're, if you don't have a wraparound. So it is really a, a safety feature. And we can talk a little bit about that when we uh, next week or possibly in our breakout rooms. But I know I have what, like three minutes left, right? You got, you got five. I have five. Boots and socks. Boots <laughs> okay. and socks, Tish. <laughs> All right. So boots and boots have been absolutely the hardest thing for women to have fit. And um, at a bare minimum, and these are my boots from when I started cutting out in the University Forest in 1982. So the good news is that if you get them to fit, um, they can last for a long time. But you really, these are steel toes, and that is the bare minimum. You do not want to be cutting in sneakers. You do not want to be cutting in clogs. You don't want to be cutting in tevas. You want to have a boot that has a, at least a steel toe on it and that it is goes above the ankle so that you have some ankle support. Um, flat soled is better. This has a bit of a heel, which this heel is not particularly good because, like, Tim mentioned you don't want your chaps long because of a tripping hazard. You don't want a high heel because of a tripping hazard. But at a bare minimum, you, flat soled, above the ankle, and steel toes. Um, they're getting easier to find in women's sizes. Um, online is a good solution. Um, the I recently, I think just last year, was able to find, these are um, cutting boots. Uh, they're made by Viking, they're online. They actually have um, Kevlar inside of them to protect all the way around. Um, they're kind of flat, steel toes. They were a hundred bucks, which is a really good value. They're definitely three season. You could put a liner in them inside because they have enough room if you needed. Oh. Amanda's got her. Yeah, these are these are uh, Carhartt brand boots. They're composite toe, so uh, same enough in terms of safety as steel toe. And I got these from uh, Winter People, I think, in Freeport. Um, but you know, there's Carhartt stores. Uh, Rennie's, I think, carries them. Um, and uh, I think uh, Lindy Wellingham might might have some periodically like this. So you can get a hiking boot style, but it has a composite or steel toe. Right. And, and those, those, those work just fine as well. 
um, they you can actually go online. Um, oh, someone wants to know how Kevlar works. We can I can do that real quick. I guess real quick. We'll go into it okay. more later, but real quick. Okay. So Kevlar is material that is what stops the the chain from running and it's threads and it's very strong threads these are chaps that i actually was wearing when i got cut and i wasn't doing anything other than cutting brush but it's the kevlar is like a string and then it binds up it's very i cannot cannot break this it's very tight uh very strong i mean and it gums up the the um the saw so that it can't work anymore so um, actually, this is ballistic nylon, and then the but the Kevlar is the same similar thing, same similar construction, which has just been like webbed into here. But it, the material, the point is that the material stops this, the chain from going around 60 miles an hour and prevents it from cutting you any further, and it stops it instantly before your eyes can say to your brain, "Oh gosh, I have a problem." Okay. So um, <clears throat> the other thing that you really don't want to do is buy a boot that's too big for you and then put on four layers of socks because it gets back to the same situation of the gloves. You don't want to be thinking about something. My boots are too big. Are they going to, you know, it just, you don't want to be thinking about anything other than the wood that's in front of you. You want to have everything be very comfortable. Um, I never, I've had folks, you know, who've used their, significant others boots because they thought it would work and it's a tripping hazard. Um, you're thinking about them not fitting, the heel slips out and you're, it's just not a good idea. Um, invest, I mean, this is really cheap insurance, invest in something that fits you and um, you're comfortable with. Okay. Cool. So helmet, boots and chaps are the cheapest insurance you can get for using a saw right now. Correct. All right. And we, go ahead. I was just going to, and if I know that I, I sped through this, um, but if you have any questions, you can email. We, we have everybody's email. Um, we have resources. We can put links up after this that would help folks um, with finding places that have equipment that they need. But, um, you know, a helmet with that fits with the full face shield, muffs, chaps that are wrap around, and boots that fit with either composite or steel toes. If you can get Kevlar, that's great. One quick pointer um, for those who would like to save the chat, at the bottom of your chat box to the right, you'll see three little dots. If you click on that, it will save the chat. Uh, but you might want to wait to the end to do that because it will only save up to this point. Great, thank you, Frank. All right, we are on schedule, amazingly. Um, so now we have a mandatory stretching break. Um, if anybody comes back early, then uh, you might be able to ask questions of Tish or Tim. Um, but uh, take, take five minutes and come back. And when we come back, we're gonna go into the parts of the saw. I know this is super quick. Thanks everybody for your patience. Please get up, stretch, walk around, say you hi to your dog. launch the poll during the break? Oh yes, yes. So uh, Frank's gonna launch a quick poll just to see kind of what you have right now for PPE. Um, don't be shy. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in five. And if, if you have questions, Tish will take a break, but might be able to answer your questions, too. And Frank, you could probably pause the recording, too. Okay. Cool. Uh, can the little tips that we got today will give you just a little a, a bit of an idea of what other uh, safety features to, um, to look for when you're buying personal protective equipment. Um, in our weekend workshops, we also will take a, a field trip to a local saw shop and we have 15 women to send on a saw shop and say, we want PPE. <laughs> um, it, it makes a statement. Um, but at any rate, this is the abbreviated version uh, online so that you can still get outside and play today. Um, so we can answer questions more later. But for now, we should continue with parts of the saw. So Frank, if you want to uh, start recording again, um, we should all go back in a speaker yeah, view. OK, so speaker view uh, so we can see Tish and go into parts of the saw. So. Parts of the saw I'm going to do jointly with Tim as well, um, but I also wanted to mention, because Tim had said in uh, quickly, which uh, was um, the protective pants, and I'm just going to go back just to show you that these are just one pair of pants, and they all, they have Kevlar, um, a pad, 
from the very top of the pant to the very bottom. And they just, they're just like uh, wearing a pair of jeans. And these are great um, for, especially if you're doing cutting in the fall, spring and um, the fall, the winter and the spring, because it's just one piece of, uh, one piece of gear to get on and then you're done. So that's all I'm gonna say about those protective pants because Tim was kind enough to bring it up. So um, Tim and I are, what's really great is that Tim is a Husky person and I'm a steel person. So, um, and we're gonna break up into breakout rooms to talk a little bit more about the saws, but regardless of what saw you have, there are components that are gonna be the same. So I don't know, like, Tim, do you wanna start? Sure. So I have two saws with me right now. Um, I do have one of my Huskies right now, but it doesn't have the bar on it. So I have a Husky in disguise as a Jones Arette as well. They're basically the same saw, just two different colors. So I'm gonna go over uh, some of the most important and basic features of a modern saw. There are many models of saws out on the market right now, but if you are searching around for a saw or using a saw, you should look for at least these key safety features, okay? The first one, probably the most important on a modern saw, is the chain break, okay? And it's mounted on top of the saw in front of the handle, and it's designed to be used quickly and easily to break the chain, okay? With one, with your hand on the rear hand hold and your forward hand on the forward hand hold, you should be able to reach forward, hope you can see this, and pull the brake back towards you to disengage it from the brake, okay? And then just by snapping the saw forward into your wrist, you can engage the brake, okay? And that can be tested. It work, um, well, you can play with it. And what we strive is using it frequently, getting a feel for it. Every time you take a few steps, we put the chain brake on, okay? Whenever you start the saw, the chain brake is on. It also works by inertia, okay? So the reverse works for this brake. If you are sawing and the saw kicks back, okay, the brake will also engage. And that can be tested simply by dropping it on a stump or something. And if they, the brake clicks, clicks on, then you know it works, okay? So when the brake's on, the chain should not move. Okay, if you put the brake on and it moves, then you have a, you have a brake that is not functioning. Okay. Another hey, safety feature on the hey, rear. Tim. Yeah, hey, Tim. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think with you waving the saw around, it's a little hard to see just the part. So if you're able to hold it more still, <laughs> yeah, I'm that, that might help. Okay, I'm actually going to switch over to this one because it might be easier to hold up in front of the camera. Okay. Okay. So on this Husqvarna here, here's the rear hand hold. Okay, an important feature here is this. This is a throttle lock, okay? And this inside here is the throttle trigger, okay? This throttle lock is designed so that you can only pull the throttle with your finger if your hand is fully wrapped around this rear hand hold, okay? That's a prevention from you walking around and haphazardly tripping and pulling the trigger and engaging the throttle, okay? So throttle lock and this rear hand hold here, or uh, the, the trigger here, okay? Um, Tish, jump in if you feel like I'm missing something. We, we like to talk about the spark arrestor, which may be really hard to see, but there's a spark screen that is mounted on top of the muffler. Okay, we wanna make sure that doesn't have holes in it. All right, what else? Hey, hey Tim, sorry, before Tim. we get onto the chain break, we had a question about, um, about uh, engaging the chain break. Tish, do you wanna address that? Sure, so um, this is one of the, it can be a struggle for women um, because our hands are, tend to be a little bit smaller. And I don't know if I, I'm trying to keep my saw stationary here, but you're, Thumb, you want your thumb underneath it and actually just be able to pull back. And this is something that you all can practice as well as just pushing forward like Tim was saying. Um, 
I don't know what the question was. Someone. Yeah. Can so show. that. Yeah. So that, that just you're answering it. Um. Also, um, okay. if you can show when you angle the saw downward, I know it's on a table now, but when you yeah. angle, yeah, that part. So you want me to show it again, just by thumb underneath. So basically, my thumb is right holding it here, and then I'm just grabbing it, pulling towards me, and then angling and pushing down. Okay. So, um, and that is the biggest safety feature that we can offer. And that's one of the things where we say when we're, we're training, you don't even take two, you don't even take a step before you put the brake on because that we really want to get that to be reinforced with people. Um, um, so, so Tish, I think that the question, so the habit that um, this person's in, <laughs> is to um, take your hand off of like where the where the throttle is and so you're only holding on to the saw with, yeah. with your left hand and then engaging the brake with your right yes 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 no 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 so <laughs> here's what you don't want to do and i'm gonna put my gloves on even though i can't stand the thought of that um and i can't i mean so if you're doing what that person said, which is having holding the saw with your left hand, taking your right hand off, first of all, you do not have two points of contact, which is important. You always want to have two points of contact. So that's an issue. And the second one is then that person's probably doing this, I would suspect. Okay, so if the saw is off and she's taking it off and doing this, what happens if she slips? I know, I know. Okay. So that's not a good technique. Um, I am, like anyone will ask you, I am a safety buffalo with respect to this. Two hands on the saw and it's just a wrist thing. That's all it is, okay? But so, you're two hands, two points of contact, always. That's one reason why the saws are designed this way. I mean, another safety feature is this platform here because it protects your hand. That's why you wanna have two hands on the saw. Okay, and Tim was pointing out on his Husky, it's the same thing. Whether you have a steel or a Husky or John Surrett or anything they ha that has that safety feature on it. Yeah, and this is one of the hard things. It's, it's hard to teach this in, uh, on an online course. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm trying to show, I'm, I'm angling the saw downward and you can use your body position and, and the angle of the saw to help you. So here I have the saw braced on my leg and I have, the, um, I have my hand on the rear handle. And at this angle, it, I don't have to like stretch or bend with my wrist. It's easy for me to keep my thumb hooked and, and, uh, and pull back on the chain brake. And then conversely, if I want to engage the brake, I flip up. So the saw again is braced on my leg and I can flip it up and it'll engage and I flip it down. And without any extra strain in my wrist, I can, um, I can uh, disengage the brake. So it's just levered on my leg up and down like that. And again, this is much easier to demonstrate in person. Um, I'm going to mute and uh, let Tish go on. But if you notice, see, this is what's really important is that, uh, that Amanda's using part of her body. And I, I don't have the space to do that, but um, to support it, which is why, again, you don't want to be taking your two hands. You want, you don't, you want to leave two hands on the saw. Um, and it's, it really actually is a much safer um, action that you're you're doing otherwise if you have one hand on your saw the saw can be going anywhere you want and our upper our strength is not in our upper body from women it's in our legs so let's use our lower legs to support it like amanda is doing does that make does that make sense to everybody perfect hopefully yeah and so uh we've definitely spent a lot longer on this safety feature but i think that might might be the most important um of all so two points of contact is one point to emphasize. We always want two points of contact. Um, you want your hand on the rear handle and you really want your thumb hooked where Tish's is right now so that you can engage or disengage that brake easily. And it's easier to do when your body position, we do have a section next week on safe posture and it'll be a little easier. For now, um, for my instructors, I would love if we could go back to just keeping the saws still <laughs> and pointing to the different parts. Um, all this is important, but let's just let people know what we're looking at first. Thank you. And okay. it might be good to angle the angle the camera down and, and keep the saw stationary on the table too. I'm not sure if that's... Does that help? There. Okay, so 
Yeah, and I just lost part of my display. Hang on here. So what I wanted to, oh, there we go. And this is gonna be a different, I mean, I can show you on this saw and then I think Tim, um, the gas and the oil, it doesn't matter what saw you have. Um, usually your gas tank will be towards the back and um, this is where the engine is. And there's a little bit of a diagram that you might see that there's a little gas tank there. And so this is where you fill with the gas. And the one that's closest to the bar right here is the bar where you fill with oil. And there's specific oil for the chain. It says uh, bar and chain oil, and you wanna keep it lubricated. What's nice now about the newer saws is automatic. When I first started, it was a manual oiler, which is dating me. But um, also on this saw is the starter cord, which is right here. And every saw will have this. And um, Every saw has this handle. Again, this is a protector. And the uh, last, how are we doing time-wise? Tim, Tim went into the spark arrestor, uh, which is on the front, but I also wanted to point out the chain catch. And I don't, um, we'll break out into breakouts, but this is another safety feature, which on mine, is tough to see, but you see this, actually it's not tough to see anymore. This right here is a chain catch. So if the saw was going around the way it does and it somehow came off its track, it would get caught here. Your hand is protected by this piece here. Okay, this is, the, this is where your uh, right hand is. And this is the, the chain catch, right, right there. And I, um, the other safety feature, and I usually like to ask this, but, and, and I will, I think, let's get a little interactive. Anyone have any idea what these, these are called the dogs. Does anyone know what these are for? What is the purpose of this? Are we getting any answers? I thought they were to grip the would if you get that deep, but I don't know. That doesn't make sense. Dig into the tree. What else? Any thoughts? So Tim had said that the spark arrestor is right in this area here, this dark area, which we probably can't see. But this is the muffler. So these dogs help keep the face of the, the uh, the motor and the face of the chainsaw away from the wood, which could in essence catch fire because of the heat. So these dogs help give it some space. Some people have, do use it to brace it against the tree if they are going to, you know, if, if they're, then this again, it's tough to show, but if they're going down into the wood, you can use it. But this, this is basically the dogs are used just to have a space the ventilation to make sure that you don't have any, um, you're too close and it could catch fire. Because there's a lot of chips. I mean, this chain's going around about 60 miles an hour. The chips are flying. So um, there's a lot of things that could catch fire is the point. So you wanna make sure that you don't have, you, you're, you keep a distance from that. And I guess, Amanda, we have, I, uh, speaking of how fast the chain is going, and the chain tooth, I wanna turn this around just slightly. There we go. Um, so let me see here, any questions? Yeah, Tish, maybe let's, can, we, can you point to your saw and just review, um, and folks can look at their own saws too. So point to the chain break. Yeah. Uh, hang on a second. Sorry, thank you. Thanks That's everybody okay. for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> Having a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so Let Tish me... is. Okay. And, yeah, so, so, so chain break first. Chain break is this, the handle yep. part. Yep, um, and then to Thank distinguish you. it. Yep, so that's the chain break which, which moves. And then we have the front handle and the rear handle. So when you're holding it, when you're holding it correctly, 
Um, you've got your left hand on the front and your right hand on the rear. On the rear, which is yep. back here. And then um, would you mind uh, pointing to the, the throttle next? The throttle is mm -hmm. right, right here, Yep. right there. So <clears throat> exactly, so it's the trigger that's on the underside of the handle and then the safety switch. Yep. This is the safety switch that Tim pointed out that if you don't have this down, this doesn't work. I can't use this unless this is down, like that, which again is another safety feature. All right, great. Thank you for reviewing that. So then the next section uh, of kind of overall parts of the saw, which Tish was about to get us into, is the bar and the chain. So that's, uh, that's where we're going next. And just as a reminder, on, on the last page of your agenda, there's a diagram that includes uh, these parts as well. And I have to say this diagram that, that uh, Rosa did is absolutely amazing. Even oh, of the sawtooth? This, yeah. 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 Um, are you and, going to talk about the sawtooth next or the, ch or the bar and chain? Uh, and we can do either one. Okay, Doesn't so matter. either way, either way, look on the last page of your agenda and you'll see a diagram that will be helpful. So um, this, is the, this is the bar and right here, let me pull it back a little bit. And this is my chain. If you notice how far this chain is dipping down, that is not good. That's a very loose chain. We're not gonna go on how to tighten it. But um, the chain goes around, and I gotta get my gloves on for this because this chain is sharp, even though it might be loose. Um, so when you're cutting, this chain is, go is pulling, I have my brake on, there we go. It's going around this way, correct? And so each tooth is actually cutting through the wood. Um, and this is what, if you get it caught into a stick or if you get it bound or you know, anything getting, <clears throat> getting the, the, the saw bound up in the ba uh, into the corner up, he up here, sorry, up here is a really bad thing because that's your kickback. Um, you wanna make sure that you're working on this part of the saw, the bar, down to here or up, use this part here. You wanna avoid this little area of the saw, the chain, uh, the bar. And again, there's a diagram of this with the kickback zone on the last page. Um, and, we're not, uh, and then I just, I think I'm gonna, do I have time to just quickly talk? I mean, we're gonna go, the, the other nice thing is that we're gonna break out into breakout rooms. We're going to go over the parts of the saw again uh, with your own specific saw. Tim's going to have the Huskies, uh, folks using Huskies. I'm going to do steels. If you don't have a saw, you're going to go into another breakout room with Amanda and Noah. Um, and um, they both have a steel and Husky, so you can ask questions about it. But one of the things that's really important about um, the saw itself and the parts of the saw is trying them out. I mean, one of the nice things about a steel is they have something called an easy start. So it's a lot easier to start it when you're pulling, pulling the saw with the cord, it's a lot easier to start. Um, but every saw, because of the way a saw is designed, it, the weight is different. And that's why you need to really try your saws before you um, buy anything. Because the way the a Husky is designed is different than a way a steel is designed. Um, um, let's see, I pointed out, are there questions? Yeah, so we're, um, there's a question about um, if you could go into a little bit more detail about the kickback and what's actually happening and just maybe point out that kickback zone one more time. All right, so I'm going to step back and let me see if I can use something. So uh hang on so while tish is doing that the top part of the chain is moving forward that's the pushing zone you saw when she was moving her chain um then that was moving forward and on the bottom of the bar the chain is moving back toward the saw so that's the pulling zone so if you picture that at 60 miles an hour the top is pushing and the bottom is pulling so when you, when you use the saw, you want to attack using the bottom corner, the tack zone, um, 
or or ideally as Tish said just the the bottom of the of the bar yep where she's pointing but what happens with kickback and I don't know if you can see this but if I can you see my desk yes if my if my saw if this is a piece of wood which it is but if my if the saw hits the top underneath of the desk the way that it's going around, that inertia, that energy has to go someplace and it's gonna come back. And now I have to move the screen. If I, it's gonna come back this way, most likely, okay? Cause that's what happens because the saw is going, this, it's going around this way. If this point gets caught in something, that energy is gonna come back towards you. Does that make sense? So when it comes back, it's going to come back this way, just the way the saw is designed. Most, that's why they have shoulder pads that have the Kevlar in them. The probability, though, which is nice now, of that happening, because when that does happen, what automatically happens is this, when a saw comes back like this, that chain break kicks in. So the probability of it happening is a lot less now than it was before. But that's what's happening with the inertia. There's a lot of energy and it's got to go someplace, so it's going to kick back. That's why you try to avoid this part right here, this area, the kickback area. Okay? Great. Thanks. Yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, so we do have time to reinforce that if you want. Um, the other just basic parts of the saw I'd want to make sure folks are uh, familiar with is where the fuel goes in versus where the oil goes in and why it's important. Okay, so, all right, so we can go back over that. Um, let me, there you go. That's up close and personal. So again, the fuel is in the back towards the engine right here. Okay, and it usually has a little symbol, which I don't know if you can see, but it's right here, of a gas tank. And the front part has where the oil goes, because that's closer to the bar. All right, so that makes sense. And there's usually a little oil indicator. Mine saw were a little cleaner. This is my much loved seal. You can see a little oil indicator there. And it's always good, my rule of thumb and other people do it differently is I usually put three, I only fill up my tank of gas for about three quarters of a tank because I don't want to run out of gas before I run out of oil because then you could burn your engine out. And as I mentioned, the bar and chain oil is different than two cycle oil. It's a, usually a little bit thicker because again, the speed, the viscosity of it is thicker because you're going through at a very high rate of speed. So it needs to be thicker. Okay. Can everybody see that? Questions? So just to reinforce, the bar and chain oil uh, lubricates that chain as it moves around at a very high rate of speed. And that's a very different function from what engine oil does and with the, with the fuel at the other part of the saw. It should, it's worth saying too, we're, we're referring to these saws as gas saws, but many of them require mixed fuel. Oh, that's, and if you that's accidentally a, put gas into a saw that requires mix, you will burn it out. Many, uh, a lot of these saws, it will say in the manual too, but maybe Tish's on the fuel compartment itself, it will have a picture of a gas pump and a drop. That drop is the indicator that it takes oil mixed with the fuel, okay? That's, that's how these types of motors lubricate themselves. And without that oil, it'll burn out. So mixed fuel for many of these saws. And um, if you can get, uh, is it non-ethanol? Because the ethanol is uh, what screws up the engines if you let it sit. But we'll, that's probably more the detail than we have time to get into. But Tim makes a good point. It is a mixed fuel. Usually it's one uh, 50 to one ratio and you need to make sure what your saw is based on with the manual. But I would encourage- We have a- Go ahead. Well, we have a question here and this relates to with my tractor safety classes. I always talk about the safety of the operator but the safety of the equipment as well. Um, so this question is about, is there a filter in the bar and chain oil reservoir 
um, you know, because of the likelihood of getting, you know, sawdust and gunk down into that um, fill. Um, mine doesn't have it. Does yours, Tim? Yes, definitely. You have a filter? Um, I've yours? never heard of a, um, yep, there's a filter in there. Uh, for the bar and ch channel, yes. Yep. Okay. I've never heard of one getting clogged, though, but I'm sure that they're off, they're replaceable. There's a filter in the fuel tank, too, which is part of routine maintenance to, to uh, change those out. Questions? Um, so uh, we had a question just to clarify about the fuel. So if, uh, Tim, if you have a moment to, um, to type into the chat box uh, the answer to that question about the, the fuel mix, um, just so we have it in writing, that would be really helpful. Um, and while Tim is doing that, yep. I'm going to, I guess, explain what will happen in our breakouts. Um, and Frank, <laughs> please correct me or back me up here. Um, so I know we just went through a lot of information again really quickly. And so what we're going to do for the next 10 minutes or so is to break out into, into breakout rooms um, by uh, your saw type, which you uh, described when you registered. So you're going to um, basically, we're going to have, we'll be in small groups of about seven or so people per group. And you can ask your questions more actively. And we'll go over again, if you're in the steel group, uh, any specifics on the steel. Um, and same thing for Husqvarna, or if you don't have a saw, we'll, we'll point to both um, and, uh, and try to answer your questions and just reinforce things a little bit more. So basically, you're going to see a little box pop up on your window that will say join breakout room. So you click join. And then at the end, uh, at the end of the 10 minutes or so, Frank's going to call us back and we'll have like a 60 second countdown or something. And hopefully you can still click, you know, join to just go back. Um, but if not, I think Frank can still pull you in either way. Um, you just might be the caboose on the on the train that time. But so we're going to break out shortly and then we will return to the main room uh, in about 10 minutes and we'll have time to do some more open ended Q&A um, and wrap up uh, and prepare us for next week before we all go. Uh, and, oh, and so Heather has a good question. Let's save it actually for the Q&A um, um, about buying a saw. We'll save that question. That's a good, very good question, Heather. So we'll save that for uh, the Q&A after the, after the breakout. All right, Frank, ready to send us into breakout rooms? Well, um, I'm having a little technical issue with that because the, the open breakout rooms feature on my thing is grayed out. Oh no! So Ouch. I did click on the move all participants into rooms automatically, but there's not a launch uh, feature. So uh, I saw this coming, and I was hoping <laughs> I'd figure out a way around it. But um, is Jason a co-host? He he is. I don't. I don't think I actually have that. Um, Frank, can you go into uh, participants? Well, I, I thought I made you a co-host ahead of time. I can do it now. Yeah. Um, Thanks everybody for your patience. We obviously wouldn't have this problem if we got to meet in person <laughs> with going into breakout rooms. You just pick up your coffee and pick up your saw and go in another room. But <laughs> we lost the key to the to the room. So. Oh no. <laughs> Uh, so do you, um, did you lose okay, the key to I all? I made you a co-host now. Okay. All right. Well, it, even if we don't get into the pre-assigned breakout rooms, um, then even if we get into breakout rooms, that'll give us a little bit of a chance. We'll see what we can do. Um, we had a question about the June in-person class. I think there are a few folks here that are doing the in-person class in June. Let's really hope that it's safe and sound for everybody to meet in person in the woods at that point. We're really, really hoping for it. So, all right. It looks like I can assign everybody one by one, but I have to be reminded which room people go into. Do you have that spreadsheet, yeah. Frank? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, tell me quickly who's in the non-chainsaw room, if you uh, have that handy. Let's see. Uh, That's I think, you. Uh, yep. Me and, uh, and Noah, um, Leonora, and Louisa. OK, you got to uh, go a little slow. Sorry. Noah, Leonora, and Lisa. You. Um, let's see. Allie couldn't make it. Uh, Hoi Ning. Yeah. 
Um, I think, uh, oh, did, I don't know if Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer Clark. Jennifer Clark. Um, let me see. Not Casey Clark. No, not Casey. Oh, although actually, sorry, I need to, uh, um, sorry, not Casey Clark. Casey has a steal. So um, Heather Davis, yeah. we could probably, pro we could probably stop recording also at this point. <laughs> Um, okay. Olivia on this morning. All right, everybody. Let's see. So, so it let's... didn't work exactly the way we planned, but it worked. <laughs> so you're you're pulling everybody back, right? Yes. Okay. I they'll. Close, I did they'll close all the rooms. Yeah, they'll. They, they should rejoin us uh, shortly then. Yeah, they had sixty seconds, I think. Yeah, they probably were wrapping up questions uh, and so forth. Yeah, 22 seconds, they'll, be, you know, they'll all be back. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, so time flies when you're talking chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it very carefully, three rooms prearranged, uh, but that didn't work. It just split us randomly in, in two. But it's all good. It worked out. It worked out well enough, good. Frank. It's yeah. Good. yeah, yeah, it worked out great. It was good. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> all right so do we have everybody back yet i hope so okay 24 um, i think is right yep all right awesome okay well thanks everybody um let's see so uh we have just a few minutes left before the top of the hour the sky is blue here in maine um it's a great day to get outside um so we really really appreciate everybody's time um so just a few quick wrap up thoughts for today and then uh, prep for next week. Um, one key question or an answer that I want folks to take home is the need or the, um, we recommend you developing a relationship with your local saw shop. Um, Tish, do you wanna um, just elaborate on that real quick? Yeah, I can. We talked a little bit about it uh, with my group, but I will definitely elaborate on it. There's, you really need to, and that's one of the reasons why we do these uh, courses is so that you learn the language. Because when you can go in and you can speak the language to the folks in the saw shop, the probability of them acknowledging you and engaging with you is much higher. So if you go in and you can say, I need a pair of wraparound traps because they're the best ones, or I need, you know, I really want to try this steel you know, whatever it is, or the Husky, whatever it is, because I've tried it and it fit well, then um, you can, that engagement really helps. And I will say that, you know, um, saw shops are getting better understanding that there are more women that are working in the woods. Um, so, uh, but find out, go to your local, saw, you know, saw shop, talk with them. They're the ones that are going to be, you know, doing the maintenance or um, maybe the larger maintenance. You, a lot of the maintenance you can do yourself, but some of the stuff you, um, you may need to have a, a saw shop work on. So you want to develop that rapport. Um, one of our instructors, Pam Wells, she's got a great rapport with this uh, steel shop and she's always getting like free chains. I don't know how she manages to do that, but. Um, it, she was on the cover of Downey's Magazine. She's oh, famous. Yeah. November issue from last year, sorry. Right here. She's with awesome. Steel. <laughs> with yeah. the steel. Um, but. Anyway, it's just that that's really, really important is to develop that relationship. Um, and um, then that takes a little bit of time. But um, what else? Yeah, that's, that's really the fundamental thing. Um, uh, and, oh, I'm sorry, uh, one of the Heathers had asked a question in the chat about uh, buying a saw, which kind of ties into that. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, Leah, take care. Um, let me see. Which, which relates to that, uh, oh, oh, so um, my dad has a steel that he loaned to me for this class. I haven't bought one yet. Should I join uh, the steel or no saw group? Oh, okay. But, she um, was in my class and we answered that question. Okay, it was great. Per Frank couldn't have done a better job. It worked out great. Hey, <laughs> nice job. Okay, so we have just a minute left before our formal closing time. Um, so I just oh wanna, God. I know time flies. Um, so real quick, so we covered a lot today, um, and I know it wasn't sufficient deep dive into everything, but it gives you an overview and it gives you something to start with. Um, next week, um, you know, same two hour window, we again, we'll have a break in the middle. Um, next week, we're going to be focusing on safe posture um, and, you know, body positioning with the saw, etc. 
are going to talk through the steps to starting a song and you'll see in your agenda that there is a link to a brief YouTube video So the first like minute and a half of it. Um, at least, well, it kind of breaks apart the saw um, visually and gives you a sense of how a saw is put together. Um, so that might be, uh, might be useful to you. Um, and so when you start a saw for the first time, there's all these little micro steps. Um, but then after that, you would be totally like set and not even think about it. But the first time you start it, um, it's helpful to have a little breakdown. So we will talk through the steps to starting a saw next week. Um, we are also going to uh, go into the breakout groups again, hopefully next week. Um, we'll also talk about safety planning, um, you know, and the, you know, what you need to do before you go into the woods. Um, and I lastly want to point out again on the, uh, what is it, page four of your agenda, additional resources. You can click on links to learn more about uh, Cooperative Extension, MOFCA, um, Midcoast Conservancy, uh, Maine Forest Service. We'll have uh, Julie Davenport join us next week. Um, and there's a Yankee Woodlot video <laughs> series as well. And the last page uh, again has the helpful graphics on uh, saws and saw parts and the sawtooth, which we didn't get into in detail. But um, so thanks everybody so much for joining us. Um, we're relieved we made it through our first online uh, chainsaw training. We look forward to seeing you all next Saturday. So thank you.